name is Shrikia Kaulai, and I am here to introduce this video about host microbe interactions. The microorganisms that live in and on your body are absolutely essential for your health and well-being. They have a very important role in my health too, helping me to digest all the plants I eat. Today, you are going to learn all about them. Hooray! I now turn it over your, to your esteemed instructor. Thank you, Ashrika Kaulai. We now begin our exploration of host microbe interactions. We begin today by talking about non-human hosts so that you realize that every macroorganism has its own microbiome. Before we begin, there are a number of terms that I will be using that I want you to be familiar with. A symbiosis is an intimate association be between two different types of organisms. Unlike the vernacular definition, it does not imply a positive interaction. There can actually be three types of symbiotic relationships. In a mutualism, both microorganisms benefit, and this is probably the way that you think about most symbioses. In commensalism, one benefits, typically the microbe, and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. In immensalism, one benefits, again, typically the microbe, while the other is harmed. I will normally use the term pathogenesis for this relationship, and this will be at the topic of module 12, so we won't talk about pathogens much in this module. Microbial partnerships are ubiquitous in nature. Almost all plants and animals have permanent resident microbial partners. We call this the normal microbiota, but you may also hear, hear the term commensal microbiota. I think normal microbiota is better because commensal implies that there's no benefit to the host, and that's certainly not true. Often, com the community of microbes will be found on mucosal surfaces, in body cavities, but can also be found in specific organs. And we'll go through examples of all of these. Sometimes they are intracellular symbionts. And again, we'll give examples of that. Most organisms are metaorganisms or superorganisms. I like the second term because it sounds more, much more exciting. There are, of course, terms used to encompass these ideas. A holobiont is the host plus its microbiota. So you are a holobiont if you consider all the organisms that are also on your body. The, a hologenome is the host genome plus the microbiota genome. And it is important because the genes of the microbiota also help the host. How we study symbiotic microbes is pretty similar to how we study any environment. We use the same tools as you would for any other environment fish, amplicon sequencing, metagenomics, and metabolomics, and other tools, of course. As an example, Quinn and co-workers sequenced 577 gigabytes of gut microbial DNA from subjects to discover patterns. There are also other tools that we haven't talked about. We will use germ-free animals, those without a microbiome, to understand it's important to the host. We will also use notobiotic animals, those with a carefully controlled microbiome where every species is known. Professor Federico Wei is a world expert in using these types of mice to answer all sorts of interesting questions, including about aging and metabolic disorders. Important animal model systems include Drosophila, C. elegans, mice, and zebrafish. So what, does, what are the functions of symbiotic microbes? They can use and did a number of different things. And the things that we're gonna look at are assimilation of major nutrients, provision of minor but essential nutrients, protector, protection from predators or parasites or environmental stresses, their role in reproduction, their role in normal physiology, their role in development, and that includes the immune system. Our first example, where the host relies on its microbiome for the assimilation of major nutrients, is the deep sea mussel, Bathymodiolus, and it uses its symbiont to acquire almost all its nutrients. This mussel has microbial symbionts that use hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, and methane as sources of energy. 
they use that energy to grow and to produce carbon and this is shared with the muscle. We know this because scientists can measure carbon incorporation into animal tissue and it's clear that the microbes are providing a majority of the carbon. However, as of right now, the mechanism of how this carbon transfer is occurring is unknown. Micro, the microbiota can also provide minor but essential nutrients. Animals often can't make their own amino acids or vitamins, and they get these essential metabolites from their diet, which is what we do, or from symbiotic microbes. Many animals have an incomplete food source. Blood lacks vitamins, if you're a blood-sucking insect or a leech. Grain, plant-based diets lack amino acids, and xylem and phloem diets lack amino acids. Microbial biosynthetic synthetic endosymbionts common, are commonly observed in these insects. Many, many insects have these types of primary endosymbionts. They're generally obligate for the insect and the symbiont. The insect cannot survive without its symbiont and the symbiont will not grow outside of its host. These are generally intracellular. They're inside the organism. You'll often see as the specific organs, such as the bacterium found in C and D. And these are specific places where these organisms grow and there can even be specific cells such as bacteriocytes and in this case the bacteria are growing right inside the cells. They provide amino acids and vitamins to the host and they're usually transmitted vertically from the parent to the offspring. There's also examples of symbiont mediated protection. And what they do is they produce protective compounds for host defense. These can be antibiotics, protein toxins, or pigments. Microbes may also facilitate protection against other environmental stresses such as heat. And there's many examples of this in insects. The example that we're gonna cover is actinomycetes as mutualists. A specific example of a bacterium providing a metabolite to its host is the actinomycetes and the bee wolf digger wasps. The wasps lay the eggs in underground burrows. The cocoons then encourage the growth of actinomycetes that in turn produce a cocktail of antimicrobial compounds that prevent other bacteria from infecting the cocoons. Panel A here shows you the digger wasp. Panel B is a picture of the actinomycetes symbiont. Panel C shows the structure of some of the antimicrobials are produced. Panel D is showing you an image of where the actinomycetes are found and how they will coat, the antibiotics coat, the cocoon. On the right is shown an inhibition test for these various compounds. And when you throw all the compounds in, as shown, which is one here, you find that it inhibits lots of different organisms and they're shown here how much they are inhibited by the different antibiotics. So this is a very interesting way of doing this. In many other relationships, the microbiota play mutual beneficial roles for the host. As you can see on the right, the microbiota has all sorts of benefits. It protects against pathogens, it matures the immune system, it facilitates digestion, synthesizes vitamins, supplies nutrients and energy, induces development, metabolizes xenobiotics, and contributes to species evolution. So you can see that it, that's, just, that's what happens in humans. And the same thing is true, it turns out, for worms. So this seems to be a very common benefit that lots of hosts get from their microbiota. For the microbiota, what they normally get is nutrition and shelter. Another example of animal microbial partnerships is Dania rero, the zebrafish and its microbiota. In those cases, fish raised in a germ-free environment develop normally until about five days post-fertilization. Then they show abnormalities. And these can be rescued by the microbiota. The microbiota are involved in development of the innate immune system, nutrient digestion, regulation of intestinal mucosal expression, stimulation of epithelial cell renewal, and production of intestinal defense enzymes. So they're doing a lot for the zebrafish and other hosts. 
Herbivores have a large contribution to their nutrition by their microbial communities. Mammals on their own are unable to extract most of the nutrients available in plants. However, they have fermentation chambers, either in their foregut or their hindgut, that contain microorganisms capable of breaking down plant material and providing nutrients. Examples of foregut fermenters include sheep and hoisin birds. Examples of hindgut fermenters include horses and rabbits. And of course, if we are going to talk about plant-eating ma mammals in Wisconsin, we have to talk about cows. Right, Ashikara and Mulai? That's correct, Dr. Poston. This is an area of active research here at UW-Madison Professor Garrett Suen's laboratory. His laboratory has investigated cow nutrition to improve the dairy industry. The rumen is a giant 100 liter anaerobic fermentation vessel that contains a complex community of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Fermentation produces short chain fatty acids or volatile fatty acids, VFA, that are used by ruminants for food. If you look carefully at the diagram on the right, you realize that this is just one variation of the community physiology I talked about at the beginning of module nine. Right? Feed, hay, etc. are broken down into cellulose and starch and sugars. This is then fermented into pyruvate, lactate, succinate, and propriate. However, at this point, a lot of this, the physiology is different. Instead of them getting passed on to cetogens, methanogens, and sulfate reducers, the cow absorbs the acetate, protonate, and butyrate and uses them, that in its own nutrition. An important side note is the significant community of methanogens present in the rumen. They not only use some nutrients of the cow and decrease in efficiency, they make cows a significant source of methane, a greenhouse gas, and this does contribute to global warming. Another example of an animal with a significant fermentation capacity is termites. While they have a tiny one microliter vessel, there are so many of them on the earth they make a significant contribution to the degradation of plant material. Their hindgut contains archaea, bacteria, and some eukarya. These eukarya contain unusual cellulitic protists, right? and they are actually able to degrade cellulose, which is something that you don't often see in protease. Acetogens tend to predominate over methanogens in the termite gut, and they produce acetate that the termite absorbs. All right, that brings us to the end of this section on non-human host microbe interactions. As you can see, macroorganisms depend on their microbiota and would not be able to survive without them.